Father God in heaven, it's in Jesus' name we come. God, we thank you for another chance, another opportunity to give you praise. For God, you're worthy. You're the great God, you're the great King. And Lord, we give you praise. For all you do, Lord, and all that you do, God, we give you praise. For all that you have done and all that you're doing right now, Lord, we give you praise. For all that you will do and all that you're going to do, Lord, we give you praise. For Lord, you are worthy of all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. Forgive us, Lord, for messing up again. Lord, we thank you now for being the righteous God who forgives us. Lord, we pray that you bless us with your word on tonight. That your word will fall on this soul. That your word will mean greatness to us. That we will receive your word, Father God, that men, women, boys, and girls will fall out with their evil ways. And Father, that we will know who you are and greet you as the almighty, awesome God, as the supreme God, the one who makes things well. And Lord, we ask you to bless us as we listen to you, that we will open our hearts to your word. Bless us as we carry your word to others, Father God, that they will obey your word and hear to your word and that they will experience a life-changing experience by way of your word. So in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Psalm number 62, Psalm number 62. God has blessed us to come together again, and we're glad about it. We're glad to be in the house of prayer, the house of the Lord. Amen. Psalm number 62, and last week we dealt with verses 1 through 6. This week we endeavor to deal with verses 7 through 12. Verses 7 through 12 in the Old Testament the book is Psalm number 62. Psalm number 62, verses 7 through 12. God has blessed us again. Hallelujah to the name. I said, God has blessed us one more again. And we're glad about it. The thing that the psalmist points out in Psalm 62 is the blessings of the Lord. And he is repetitive in talking about God. Oh, if the church would be repetitive in talking about God. If the church, the church members, if the pastor, if the friends, if the neighbors would just be repetitive in talking about God. So this psalmist, David is the writer, and he writes at a time where his life is at stake. He writes at a time where his enemies are all around him. And he writes at a time where he acknowledges God. When you're in trouble, you better acknowledge God. All right, when, you're, when your enemy is about you, you better acknowledge God. So David acknowledges God. And when he acknowledges God, he talks about how good God is and what God does and how God does things and the mannerisms of God. I was speaking on yesterday to a fellow, and we were talking about 
our God want uh, the leader to know his ways because the people are looking forward to the mighty acts. So every leader ought to know the ways of God. And sometimes the people ought to get a glimpse at the ways of God. So we need to know God's ways and not just look for his mighty acts. And when we look for his ways, we will know who he is and we will rejoice in who God is. That's what the psalmist does tonight. The psalmist, in Psalm number 62, verses 7 through 12, he continues and you will find a string that ties verses 1 through 6 to verses 7 through 12 because the psalmist is just appreciating God. Do you appreciate God? Do you appreciate who God is? Do you appreciate what God does? So the psalmist praises God for who he is, and then he praises God for what God does. Amen? Amen. Verse number seven. In God is my salvation and my glory. I told you last week the word salvation is deliverance. Remember, David's in trouble. He's in trouble. When your enemies are on your trail, you're in trouble. It doesn't matter how big, big, bad, and bold you are. When you have enemies on your trail, let me tell you, you're in trouble. Because mm -hmm. enemies don't come to play pity back with you. Mm -hmm. Enemies don't come to shoot marbles with you. Enemies don't come to pat you on the back. Enemies come to take you flat on out. Mm -hmm. Enemies come to deny the glory of God, deny the power of God, deny who God is, but they come, they show up with the intentions of taking you out. That's why growing up, I didn't, I didn't play wrestling. A lot of people play wrestling. I can't, I can't play wrestling because I'm going to be like the little children. You hit me too hard, I'm going to hit back. I couldn't play wrestling because I knew that if you begin to get the best of me, anything could happen. Because the enemy never plays fair. Mm -hmm. That's right. The enemy never plays fair, and it's evident that he doesn't play fair in the fact that he takes advantage of little bitty children. Mm -hmm. When you see a, a predator, a dog, uh, an alligator, they always focus on the smallest person in the group. We were riding on the trail one day, and, and as we were riding our bikes on the trail, one of the gentlemen had his little granddaughter with him, and she was about, about five years old. He had her sitting crossways on the bar in front of him, and we are just riding, minding our business, and all of a sudden, the guy shows up with a dog. Matter of fact, he shows up with two dogs. One dog, is a small dog, the other is a big, huge dog. And when he got close to us, within 10 feet of us, the big dog broke the leash. And when he broke the leash, he, he didn't come after us, he went straight for the baby. Big, huge dog. He squared off, you could see his chest rising, his legs was pointed out, and he went straight for the baby. It's because the enemy will always go after the weak. Always go after the, the little, the tiny. And so the enemy doesn't play fair. That's why I couldn't play WWE. Can't, can't play. The enemy doesn't play fair. You hit me in my eye, I'm going to bite you, scratch you, do whatever girls do, I'm going to do. Because the enemy does not play so there are no fair fights. You have to scratch for your life. In this spiritual walk with God, we're in the middle of a warfare. And as we're in the middle of a warfare, we know the enemy has shown up to take us out. So, so David knows that he needs to run to God. He says, in God is my salvation and my glory. God, the supreme one. God, the supreme being, God, the creator of the universe, I have to know in him is my deliverance. 
And him is the one that's going to keep me on top. When you look at wrestling, you know, somebody got to be on top and they hold the other person down. And as long as their shoulder and their backs are tied to the mats, the referee can, the mats, the mats, the referee can count them out. One, two, three, and he's out. But every time he raises up, the referee got startled. That's too much carrying on for me. I can't, I can't have all that carrying on. You know, the enemy is out to take you out, and he's not wrestling fair. He's not, he's not going by the rules. He's not one, two, three. That's why parents should not be counted when they tell children to do something. One, two, three. We didn't have that luxury in the David's household. There were three. One, he told you. If you didn't do it, two, you got a punch. If you didn't do it, three, you hit the floor. I mean, period. I mean, it's, it's over. Lights out. It's over. Thank God it didn't have to happen too many times. Because the enemy, you see, parents have to discipline their children because the police doesn't know how much to put on. Parents know how much to put on their children how much pressure to apply, when it's time to talk, when it's time to, to, to discipline in a corporate way. Police officers don't care. So parents discipline in order for the police officer to not have to. Because the enemy is perfect. So we ought to depend on God. He says, in God is my salvation. In God is my deliverance. In my glory. And when he, when he says glory, he's talking about his glorious salvation. In other words, there is no salvation, there is no deliverance except from the deliverance that God has given. And that God is able to give. And you know, God can deliver you. He can snatch you out. In the midst of all that's going on around you, God can really snatch you out, get you out of trouble. He delivers us. It's not our smarts. It's not who we were born to. It's not because we know everything and everybody. It's not your connection and your network. It is God that delivers us. So the psalmist understands, David understands that if I'm going to be delivered, it's going to be delivered from God. He says, in God is my salvation. I in God. I in God. In God. He didn't say A-N-D God. He says I in God. In other words, there is no and that will deliver me. It is the fact that I'm in God that I'm being delivered. It says, in God, in God is my salvation, in God is my deliverance, in God is the glorious salvation that, that God has delivered me. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. You, you ever heard the song, the song says, you are my strength? That's where it comes from. He says that in this word rock means the source of. This word rock is a boulder. This word rock is a, is a mighty fortress. He says in God, God is my rock. God is my strength. The rock of my strength. The source. You are the source of my strength. You are, because God is the source of our strength. That's why choirs are the same songs that honor God. Mm -hmm. I know beats feel good, beats make us move, but if the beat does not honor God, we ought not be seen. The songwriter says you are the source, and the, the psalmist says this word rock means the source of my strength. He's the source of my safety. 
Rob says he's my safety. He's the source of my safety. In other words, it does not come from anybody but God. He is the one who originated. He is the one that, that makes us whole. He is the one that makes things right. He snatches us out. He moves us over. See, somebody says, if my enemy's going to dig a ditch for me, he better dig too. Nah. Because the God we serve, he sees the ditch digger when he's digging the ditch. So I never say that if he dig one ditch, he better dig two, because he can dig that one and God can have him fall in it. He doesn't need to dig one for me, because it is going to be backfiring. God is is my rock. He's my strength. He is my refuge. The word refuge, he's, he's my fortress. He's my hiding place. He's my place of escape. You see, sometimes you got to fight. Other times, you got to hide. And sometimes you need to run and hide. Men, men think they're big and bad until the rubber meets the road. I thank God for being my refuge. He is my place of escape. He's my hiding place. And my refuge is in God. Who is my refuge in? The supreme God. The one who makes a way out of nowhere. He is my refuge. He is my place of safety. He is my rock. He is my place of escape. He is God. Sometimes on your job, you need to understand that God keeps you. On your job, sometimes they promise you that you're the next one. But God I God takes it off their minds. God creates a place for you to escape. He's our refuge. He's a place. He covers us. There were two trees in the forest. And every time I tell this story, I tell it to fit the scripture. So I, I make it up as I go. It's called a hyperbole. There were two trees in the forest. And of course, the, the little tree had much energy. And he would bounce around and talk about, hey, old man, talking to the big tree, talking to the old tree. Hey, old man, you can't bend like I can bend. You can't fold like I can fold. You can't move like I can move. You're an old tree. You can't handle it like I can handle it. Then a storm came. The wind began to blow. The rain began to fall. And all of a sudden, this little bit of tree got scared. It got black. It was so black they couldn't see each other. You heard nothing in the storm from the little tree. When the storm cleared, the big tree was standing there. The little tree pops up. Look at you, old man. You got a hole in your bark. You got a hole in your limb. You, you couldn't even make it through the storm without getting torn up. The old tree had to remind the little popping tree, the little mouthing tree. When the storm came, I took my arms. I took my strong branches and I wrapped them around you and I covered you. See, some of us are, are saved and know that we are, and in the midst of our salvation, we, we just brag about who we are in Christ. But when the storm comes, we need the same God to take his branches and cover us. He is our refuge. He's our place of safety. He's our hiding place. He is our place of escape. One thing they teach you in martial arts, you can either fight 
You can either run or you can just hide and avoid the danger. So one of the one of the one of the examples they give is there's a person coming in the door and there's a person standing in the door. When you're young and when you think you got it going on, your idea is I'm gonna walk in the door and I'm gonna take him out. I'm going down with thrust, I'm going down with action, I'm going to hit him with an uppercut, I'm going to take him out. The master says, you fool. Another person says that I know he's standing there, I'm going to run through the door and I'm going to run through there. The master says, you fool. First of all, he's standing inside, he can see you and you can't see him. And if you're going to come in and take him out, you need to understand he got an advantage on you. The second person that's going to run in, and he's going to run in and run past and then going to take him out. The, the fact of the matter is, he can see you before you see him. And not only that, he can just trip you up while you're running. The third person, he said, if I know he's in the room, I'm going to stay outside the door. What he said, and, and, and the master said, he says, all oh, you wise fellow you. He says, God has given you separation. He's given you a way of escape. And you, your buddy running in to take him out. And he, he's at a disadvantage. Your other buddy running in and he's going to run past him. He's at a disadvantage. But when you have a hiding place, when you have a way of escape, Take the way of escape. Stop trying to prove stuff to people. Young people are always trying to prove themselves. Always trying to prove who they are. But when you, when you experience, you are looking for a way out. You are looking for a way of escape. You are looking for a way to avoid conflict. Allow God to cover you. Allow God to shield you. Allow God to give you wisdom enough to stand still and wait on him. And verses 1 through 6 says, stand still, wait on God. Whatever you do, just wait on God. And when you wait on him, wait in silence. We have to get wisdom enough to know that we cannot take on the world, but God can. But the text says he's my refuge, he's my hiding place, and my hiding place, my refuge, my place of escape is in God. So take, take your place of escape. Call on God. You don't have to do it all by yourself. Trust God to do it. The next verse, the next verse says it like this. Verse number eight says, trust in him at all times. Trust in him at all times, you people. He says to us, not just one of us, but all of us need to trust in him at all, every time. Mm -hmm. Trust in God. The word trust means to put your hope in. All times means all seasons. And continually. Trust in God at all times. Do it all seasons and do it continually. You see, we got people, we got categories of people in their trust. One category is I'm going to trust them as long as things are going well. I, oh, they, you can't beat some people talking about God when things are going well. Oh, look at the God I serve. Oh, God is so good. When this group of people go to the hospital and the doctor gives them good news and they come back and they celebrate and you ought to celebrate, but is God good even if you don't make it? Is he still good? First thing we say, God is so good. If you ask Sister Davis in her, her medical delivery, she'll tell you, God is good. But if we don't make it, we have to understand that the God we serve is still good. We have to trust him in the good times, the bad times. Then there's another group. The other group will trust him as long as they're going through. God, I'm going to depend on you. I know you're not short of your word. God, your word says that all things work together for the good. 
But the moment they get through, they through with God. Y'all know some members of the New Beginning Church like that. When long as there are some people when they're going through, I mean, they're on the floor rolling, they're standing and waving their arms and calling on God and asking God to deliver them and to keep them. And then when God takes them through, now God, I'm through with you. <laughs> they through. I'm, I'm done. You know, we got new statements on the block now. I'm done. And one lady said, I'm, I'm Mississippi Don. I'm D-U-N Don. She said, I'm sure of Don. I'm through. And, and, and when they say that, it's not just through with people. They're through with God. And then you got the seasonal folk that will trust him. They trust him for a season, and then they get tired of trusting God. They get like we get with masks. How many of you tired of these masks? I mean, you won't wear your makeup again. Amen. How, how many of you want, want to show off your hair without having a mask in front of you? How many of you want your lipstick to match your dress again? All right. That's my type of stuff. <laughs> how many of you want to make sure your, your lip gloss is in the right place? How many of you tired of your glasses getting fogged up from from, from the mask. Yeah. I mean, how many of you tired of smelling the ink that they put in the mask? Mm -hmm. That's how some people are with God. Yeah. God, I've been calling on you all this time and you ain't answered yet. So I'm sick and tired of you. Mm -hmm. Then there's another group when it comes to trusting Him. The other group is. They get so bitter with God, they can't trust God. Matter of fact, don't even call to God in my presence. Don't tell me, well, they told me, I didn't want to hear, that's why they didn't call you. I made this own bad decision on my own. I didn't want to hear from you, and I didn't want to hear from God. Let me make my own decision so I can live. I said, don't live with it then. Don't live with it, your bad self. And they get bitter with God. And, and they don't want Christians anywhere around them. They don't want to hear about the Bible. They don't want to hear about God. The text says, trust him in all seasons, in all times. All you people trust him. And then there's another group that trusts him temporar temporarily. It's the group who say the only thing down there at that church are a bunch of hypocrites. Mm -hmm. They ain't going down there, they are hypocrites. And I know many of us, including pastors, including preachers, have given Christians a bad name. I understand that. But my statement to you today, don't let unholy folk keep you away from a holy God. Don't, don't let unholy people keep you away from a holy God. Don't let imperfect people keep you away from the perfect God. Our sign's been out there a, little, a good four years now, way before COVID. It says, Jesus was hurt at the church. Jesus was hurt by the church. Jesus was hurt by the church and he still comes. Jesus was hurt by the church, but he still comes. What's your excuse? There's a group that's temperamental. They, they base their relationship with God on what they see from mankind. Don't let unholy people keep you away from a holy God. Don't let imperfect people keep you away from a perfect God. Stick with it. Stay with it. Trust him. Trust him at all times, you people. The next part of that verse says, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. See, David, David, they would, if David was living today, they would call him a weak Christian. They would call him a weak child of God. 
But let me tell you, David knew when he got in trouble where to run. <laughs> David, David knew where to run when he got in trouble. And many times David got himself in trouble. And he's still God. Here I am. Read, read Psalm 51 sometime. Lord, restore with me with the right spirit. Uphold me with your sweet spirit. Forgive me for my transgression. Wash me with himself until I become clean. God, I'm at your mercy. We got to know how to run to God. David knew how to run to God. I always tell that story about the late Pastor E.B. Hill. When he was pastor of the church, he had, he had done something wrong. He didn't say what it was. He didn't say if he did something to somebody. He had done something wrong and only one woman knew about it. Now, that doesn't mean that he was with that woman, okay? So he says that that, that woman showed up at church that Sunday. And he saw her. And when he opened the doors of the church, this is when people can come up and talk. We, we realize, pastors have realized that that's dangerous now. Woman comes down the aisle doing the invitation, and, and he gives her the microphone. But before he gives her the microphone, he sees her coming. In the midst of the invitation, he sits back in his seat. And this is a big wooden pool pit. <laughs> he sits back in his seat and he sits there and he, re he remembers what David said. Blot out my transgressions. And he just knows this woman coming down the aisle to tell the whole church what he's done. He sits in his seat in the pool pit and while she's walking, he said, Lord, blot it out. Lord, blot it out. Lord, blot it out. So she comes down now, he gives her the mic, and she's talking about how great of a man he was, and how he's a man of God, and you all ought to follow this man of God, this is a great man of God. Let me tell you something, God covered E.B. Hill that day. <laughs> he covered him. You got to trust him to cover him. He covered him that day. He covered him. He covered him in the midst of the devil. Says trust him at all times. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. So pour out your heart. I mean let God have it. How many of you in your prayer time just let God have it? Slinging tears. Slinging snot. Slinging slobbering. God is just you and me. I'm coming before you, Lord. I'm giving it all to you, Lord. You gotta pour, your, pour out your, your heart before the Lord. Pour out your innermost being. You, you, you let everything hang out for your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, your wife. You feel like you can, you can do all things and tell all things in their presence. Do it before the Lord. David says, pour out your whole heart before God. After all, he says, after all, he is our refuge. He's our shelter in time of storm. He's our shelter. Noah, Noah worked on a boat for many years and people made fun of him. He kept hammering on the boat. And he had one song and one sermon. The same words, it's going to rain. Next day he said, it's going to rain. He just kept nailing, kept sawing. It's going to rain. And he didn't have no electric saw. He, he just kept nailing and kept sawing. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. He looked like a fool, but he said, it's going to rain. He trusted him when it went proper to trust him. Because when it rained, that boat, that ark became his refuge. God is our refuge. He's our very help in time of trouble. Call unto him. Old folks said, call upon him while you can. Call upon him while he can hear you. Because when your tongue cleaves to the roof of your mouth, it is too late to call on him. You know, the thing about it is we put time limits on everything and everybody, including God. 
We think the little five minute prayer that we pray in the morning and the two minute prayer we pray at night is, is good enough. And now some of us have gotten sophisticated. We even pray in the car. And we ought to. We ought to pray at all times. But we have to understand you have to pour yourself out before the Lord. Because check this out. He already knows. So. We serve the omniscient God. The God that knows everything. We, we serve the omnipresence God. The God who's right there with you everywhere at the same time. And then since he's the sovereign God, and he does what he wants to do, we might as well tell him what we want him, him to know. Pull it out before. Now, Lord, now I've been coming to you. And here I am again, Lord. You got to pull it all out there. Think of one thing that you haven't told God. Think of one thing that you haven't given to God. Think of one thing you have not laid out before God. David says, pour it out before the Lord. Lay it all out there. Whenever a person is going to court and you have a lawyer involved, you need to tell your lawyer everything. Because the person that's in opposition to you is going to tell the state and tell their lawyer everything. And you don't want your lawyer to be surprised in the courtroom. You don't want your lawyer to be surprised. And then now you got a lawyer that you're paying that can't do his job or her job because she or he does not have the proper information. God is our magistrate. He's our judge. Jesus is our defense attorney. He's our lawyer. Throw it all out there. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Give it all to him. Because he is our refuge. He's our escape. He is our refuge. He's our hiding place. Verse 9 says, Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than paper. See, we put people in categories, but not God. <laughs> it says, first of all, the men of low degree, people that don't have a big time status, we measure those things. Then he says, these people of low degree are vapor. Mean that it's vanity, it is, it is insignificant, it is empty, it is dissatisfactory, it is a vapor, it is vanity, it's a vapor, it is it's unsatisfactory, it is empty, it is dissatisfactory. Men of high degree are lie, mean they're false. In other words, if you have a person who think they are somebody and they really not, then it's all false. You do know that everything you don't, everything you see on Instagram is not true, right? <clears throat> you do know that people drive to luxurious places, stand in front of those places, or go into those places and take pictures, right? Yeah. Yeah. I remember when we when we would when I used to do videos and photography, we will find a building that have the right flowers in the background. And if a girl wanted to produce a video, a musical video, she would have these flowers and, and I would shoot and watch her walk out the flowers. I remember following a lady to, to a very nicely manicured uh, pastor one day, a nicely manicured park, and put the music on and she praised dance to that music. After, you know she don't own those places, right? And you know everybody who takes a picture in the car does not own the car, right? One girl posted one girl posted on Facebook herself sitting in a nice white Mercedes Benz. She drove a hoop to work. But she's in a nice white on white on white on white 
inside and out, white top, red white top, uh, and a glowing white, glistening white Mercedes Benz. When she got to work, everybody rushed outside to see her car. And she was driving the same group. It's because she posted it as if it was hers. A lot of men steal a woman's life savings, steal women's life savings because of pictures and videos. And I don't see how people can really be that dull, trying to get a whole bank account over to somebody that they so madly in love that they met two weeks ago. I mean, they just turn it all over to those people who have put together a facade. The Bible says those of high degree are a lot, they're false. And it says when you put them on the scale and weigh them, this word scale, this word scale means the balances. It's a, a balancing beam, and it reminds me of weighing cotton in the country. There was, a, there was a weight on this side, and you put the, the cotton on this side. And they would just keep putting weight on it until the balance, the, the scale balances out, and then that's how you get the weight of the cotton. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a scale like you and I step on, mm -hmm. and it gives you out a number. Such a deal here, it says, but when you put all of them, the low degree, in the high degree, on scales, on balances, all together, they are lighter than vapor. Remember, vapor is emptiness. Vapor is dissatisfaction, un unsatisfaction. Vapor is vanity. And all that is vanity will not make it in the presence of God. So we have to brag on God. Talk about how good God is. Verses 10 through 12. Do not trust in oppression. Nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. The psalmist start talking like the wise writer in Proverbs. He says, do not trust in oppression. Don't, don't trust in the unjust. Don't let those who are being unfair to you distract you. He says, don't, don't trust in the, the false, the phony, the oppressed, the oppression. Don't let oppression phase you. There's a group of people who used to make men and here in the city of Houston. These men would work selling cars all day. Now that, that dealership has closed down, got a new name. These men would work selling cars all day for two weeks. And when they went to get paid, the supervisor would make them crawl on their knees for their checks. That Chevrolet dealership had to go out of business and it's, it's a new name now. But he would oppress them to the point where they would have to, like little children who have not walked before, crawl on their knees and beg for their checks. Oppression. He says, don't put your trust in that. And he says, don't put your trust in vainly hoping in robbery. This word robbery means to take by force, to take by violence. The difference between stealing and robbing is that you steal when nobody's looking, but when you rob somebody, you hold them up at gunpoint right there on the spot, in their face, and you do it in a violent nature. You hold them hostage. You take their stuff. Don't be moved by that, the writer says. If riches increase, if you get more money, get more wealth, get more valor, do not set your heart on them. Don't trust in them. It says whatever you do, trust God. Don't 
Don't, don't let people oppress you and, and make you do stuff. In other words, pure pressure. Pure pressure and peer pressure. Don't let it be what controls you. I know some of you in this room have looked at, at roots and looked at um, African American slave trading and you said, it wouldn't make me do that. I know some of you have said, I'm so glad I wasn't born back then. I know you are. Because when it comes to oppression, we've been free so long until we can't handle that. What it says, do not set your heart. This word heart here is fruit. Don't set your heart on richness. Don't let wealthiness control you. It says to us today, whatever you do, trust God. Verses 12, 11 and 12 says, God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that the power belongs to God. He says, the might belongs to God. Now he already says, don't set your heart on riches. He says, don't let robbery overtake you. He says, don't be enticed by oppression. And now he says to us, God has spoken this once. God has spoken this twice, and I've heard it twice. That the power belongs to God. This word power is might. Security belongs to God. Matter of fact, the boldness belongs to God. He says to us today, trust in God. Found in verse number 12. Verse number 12 says, also to you, O Lord, belongs, be, be, belongs mercy. In other words, Lord, mercy belongs to you. The word mercy is favor, kindness, and goodness. If you don't get some mercy, you can forget about man. Mercy comes from God. You can forget about mama. Mercy comes from God. He says mercy belongs to, to the Lord. Oh Lord belongs mercy. Oh to you, O oh Lord, belong mercy. God has mercy for us. He has favor. He has goodness. He has kindness for us. For you render to each one, for he, for you render to each one according to his works. Remember, the psalmist is talking to God. And he said to God, God, whatever you do, I know you are fair. I know you give to everybody according to their works. He says, first of all, God, you have mercy. In other words, you don't allow me to die when I should have. You do not discipline me like I should be disciplined. You do not abuse me like I deserve to be abused. And then he comes back and says, God, you reward everybody fairly. You give, I know, I know when you look at other folk, it looks like it's not fair. The psalmist in Psalm 73 says it like this. He says, I looked at the wicked. And I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I saw the wicked prospering. And here I am trusting God. And I can't get a hill of a bit. The psalmist says, I looked at the wicked and the wicked was prosperous. They were way more prosperous than I was. And here I am, Lord, I'm trying to do your will. Lord, I'm trying to do what's right for you. Lord, I'm treating people right. Lord, I'm going to church on Sunday. Lord, I'm giving my time. And I see this joker down there that's poisoning children. He's riding what he wants riding. He got all he wants to do. He wants to have. And here I am, Lord. I'm begging you, Lord. I'm trusting you. Lord, give me what I'm asking. Then the psalmist in Psalm 73 says, he did not understand until he went into the sanctuary of the Lord. 
And then I understood that the wicked got a, de a devastating day coming. He said, when I went into the sanctuary, the synagogue of God, then I understood real good that the wicked is headed for destruction. That's why we tell our children, don't get rich quick. Because it's coming to a devastating screeching halt. There are so many children dying from drugs because they thought they could get a quick high and move on. I've told you over and over again, if I pass away and there's drugs or alcohol in my system, you need to go launch a full-scale investigation because I didn't put it there. It was injected, it was forced, even may have been pouring down my throat. <laughs> you need to understand that God will render mercy unto each of us and God will reward us for the work we do. Now this is the thing. People want God. Anybody in this room want God to say say servant well done. Anybody raise your hand. If you want God to say servant well done. Do you really want God to say servant well done? Now, the little time we spent on planet Earth, even if it's, if it's 120 years, the little time we spent on planet Earth is nothing to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed by Christ Jesus on the other side. And we have to be faithful to what God does for us now and where God places us. If we're not faithful down here, why you want God to say, servant, well done? You ought to examine yourself. Paul says, examine yourself. And you ought not just examine yourself when it's time for communion. Mm. You ought to go day by day examining yourself. God help I deserve to hear servant well done. Let me just tell you. In order to hear servant well done, you would have to have done well. Because remember, God reward according to our works. And if you're going to hear servant well done, you're going to have to do well. Because it says men lie, God doesn't lie. Mm -hmm. Will you hear servant well done? Are you, will you hear servant, you did something. You did something. You, you, you accumulated something. God wants to say servant well done. And you know the thing is, we don't have to tell anybody what they've done. We don't have to remind people what they have not done. A lady asked me one time, were you talking to me in my sermon? I said, everybody in the room I was talking to. Well, it sounded like you were preaching directly to me. I said, that's what the word does. It hits you where you are. We ought to leave here some Sundays and some Wednesdays like Zorro has cut us up. I don't enjoy every message either. But there's one thing about it, it's never junk mail. God said to Ezekiel, eat the whole roll. It's better God eat the whole roll. The same gospel that makes Annie shout will make Susan pout. But it's good for your soul. And if you want an example of well done, if you want an example of someone who did well, if you want an example of someone whose rewards were great and are great, look to Jesus. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. Because Jesus could have called a legion of angels to come down, but he stayed on the cross. He died, he was buried, and he rose from the dead. <laughs> it was a dark time, but Jesus gave his life for us. The door of the church is open. Imitation is extended. We have to trust Jesus in order to make it. The door is open. If there's anyone who's not received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, this is your moment. You can get it right with God. If there's anyone who has neglected your duties, this is your moment. First of all, if you have not been saved, would you bow your head with me and invite Christ into your life? 
Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. I thank you for saving my soul in Jesus' name. Amen. If you honestly believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he rose from the dead after he gave his life, this is your moment you're now saved, born again on your way to heaven. And there may be others who the text declares God will render to each one according to his words, according to your deeds. Let me pray with you. Lord God, we confess that we have not done it right. We confess, Lord, that we've fallen short. God, we confess that we have not poured out ourselves unto you. And we have not done well with what you've given us to do. God, I ask you to forgive us. Bless us in our private time to call unto you and pour out ourselves unto you. Bless us, Lord, that we will turn over a brand new activity. One that will please you, Father God. One that will be a blessing. That will glorify you and bless other people. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for being selfish and, and not doing the work of the kingdom. Lord, we ask you to encourage us, to, to excite us, to ignite us, to be about your will and do your business. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and amen. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give unto the Lord. For those of you who are giving electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Zelle, lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in uh, your gifts, you can do so by mailing it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for being a part of our service on tonight. We're looking forward to seeing you for, for Bible study every Wednesday night at 7.15. Seeing you on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. And also for worship service at 10.30 a.m. That is our Sunday school at 9 a.m. Come by and be a part of our services. Amen. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you, Father, for blessing us and keeping us. We thank you for your word. Lord, we ask you to bless your word to be strong, be strengthened, to be refuge. We thank you, God, for who you are and for what you do. We ask you to bless, Father God, every listener. We pray that you bless and heal as only you can. God, encourage as only you can. And Lord, convict as only you can. That our lives will be made the better that we will run and tell of God's goodness, and that you, Father God, will receive the glory. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us join together by saying, Amen and Amen. Let us stand for our mission and vision statement. We are united in church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32, you are dismissed.